go. All right. It, it is what it is. Welcome to tonight's show. And <laughs> welcome to tonight's show. We are talking about uh, a passion of mine. If you believe it or not, this is actually, this is a passion of mine. I love canned food. I do. I love it for a variety of reasons. And it's been a while since we've done any kind of deep dive, uh, historic deep dive on the channel. So I figured it was time to dive into the history of canned food from one of my favorite websites, Atlas Obscura. You can't go wrong with Atlas Obscura. They always have interesting articles. Um, this is called How Canned Food Went from Military Rations to fa Fancy Appetizers. This is a simple technology that changed the world. It's by Ann Ubank. E-W-B-A-N-K, Ubank, and it's from November 13th, 2023. So that's today. Um, fresh article for us today. The history of canned food. You got to think about how this technology really did change the world, man. I mean, think about all the places human beings could not go because they had no way to preserve their food in a, in a meaningful, long-term way. You know, you had stuff like pemmican. You could you could smoke your food. You could ferment certain foods, but like you know, the, to have like a wide selection of food readily available in a can. I mean, that's kind of unheard of. Think about it. look at all these cans of food too. Imagine all. Imagine tallying up every single can of food ever made in the history of of canning. This is a warehouse full of canned salmon if you could believe it. How about that? Uh, okay, so this article is actually adapted from the November 11th, 2023 edition of Gastro Obscura's Favorite Things newsletter, which you can sign up for if you want to. Um, Anne writes, let me ask you a question. What pops into your mind when you envision a can of food? For some of us, it's a simply a, a can of cream of mushroom soup. For others, the meal of the moment is an expensive tin of fish imported from Portugal. That's what really got me on a, on a hook, on a kick for canned foods. I was reading an article about how nutritious tinned fish is. And in Europe, that's all they eat. They eat fish out of tins. It's a whole thing. And if you go to the international section in your supermarket, you're going to find all kinds of tinned fish. You know, including they have tinned, um, you know, they have oysters, octopus, uh, squid, all of it, calamari, all of it is delicious. You know, it's relatively cheap and it's really good for you. You got omega-3 fatty acids that you need. You got protein. You could store it in your pantry. It lasts for a long time. Let's say you got a, a, a thing of ramen. You could rip open. You can bust out a, a, a ramen noodles. And yet you can fancy it up with a tin of fish. Sardines. Sardines are a little bit more of an acquired taste. Anchovies, too salty for me. Um, smoked trout, delicious. Salmon, forget about it. All of it, great stuff. Really, really, really great stuff. But what is the history behind it? How did it come to be? Um, Perhaps you get the sense of nostalgia seeing tinned pumpkin puree, jellied cranberry sauce, and green beans neatly lined up on store shelves this time of year because it's Thanksgiving. Or your basement could be filled with cans of soup in case disaster strikes. Grab a can opener, readers. Today, we will be cracking open the history of all things tinned. Okay, Anne, I'm ready. Let's take that journey. Warfare. This is an 1898 etching of a French canned food factory. Very interesting. Look at that. And then they're moving around giant vats, vats of stuff there. <clears throat> the story goes something like this. In the late 18th century, the French government issued a challenge to European investors. Whoever could come up with an efficient way of preserving food for the French army would win a cash prize. Because back then, Food, think about it like this. The key 
to uh, listen, whether we, we all know that imperialism and colonialism and these things are bad, these are bad things that occurred. But back then, the when the world was all about imperialism, I mean, I guess it still kind of is in a different kind of way. When the world was all about imperialism, you had the British Empire, you had the French Empire, you had all these empires, the Spanish Empire. The the what was the thing that predicated you on controlling regions of land, your armies? You needed to have armies that were competent and able to hold the ground for your vast empire. What did armies need in order to do this? Food. So it's like food in a weird kind of way is this super essential thing to vast power. There's vast power in food. In fact, I believe, okay, don't quote me on this. I think we read this previously somewhere. I, it's said, it's credited that M&Ms helped the GIs to win World War II. I'm going to, I'm hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and just double check that. Did M and M's help win World War II? Up. Oh. Well, how about that? Uh, no, inconclusive. Was anyone? No, it doesn't. I could have. Sw- I could have sworn. I mean, that that would make for an interesting episode in the future. I could have sworn something like that. M and M's helped the GIs win World War II. It boosted morale. I can't find it. I have to do a search. It did not pop up in that Google search. I was expecting it to pop up in that Google search. So I have a little bit of egg on my face. Whatever. Not a big deal. The point being here is that why would the French army, why would they want a way of preserving food for the French army? Because that would allow the French army to, you know, go out and be armying around a lot longer than they normally could with, you know, supply lines and rations. You have supply lines. What are supply lines? Those are the, uh, the avenues for which supplies are passed down to uh, the various camps of soldiers that are holding down territory for you or doing whatever it is that they're doing. People need to be fed, right? You know, before food preservation, the way that the army would, um, you know, what they would do is you would get stuff like hardtack and salted pork. And, you know, I don't think that stopped even after they had canned food because canning food is probably very expensive. But the idea of what a salted pork, you get a pound of salted pork. It's like dried salted pork. And what you have to do in order to be able to even eat it is that you have to rehydrate it and desalt it in boiling water before you can even begin to prepare it. And then hardtack, extremely dry, extremely dense, hard biscuits of flour and water. The reason why they're extremely dry and hard, why they were called hardtack is because, first of all, you could break your teeth trying to bite down on one of them. But second, that was the only way if, if, if there was any moisture, then, then the hardtack would spoil. And, you know, there's various accounts and journals. If you read pirates from pirates and all sorts of people of, of people finding maggots in, in the hardtack biscuits and the ship biscuits, and they would eat them anyway, because that's, you know, Hey, it's extra protein. <coughs> I think it was not uncommon, you know, back then just to even eat things that were slightly off. It was the only way to keep going, you know, um, is same thing like, you know, to prevent scurvy. That's why they called the, the pejorative term for British people is limeys because they would drink lime juice. They'd have these big barrels of lime juice. And it was uh, essentially a supplement that you kept in your diet so you could have vitamin C so you didn't get scurvy, which is a really nasty sort of affliction. Um, to, to have, you know, and you go long, 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 long times without having fruits available. It's hard to keep fruits on a ship. It's a lot easier to keep salted pork. It's a lot easier to keep biscuits, right? Could you imagine the constipation? Oh my Lord. Um, in any case, canned food changes all that. Suddenly you could have a meal that's just, you know, of a higher caliber, Right. All right. Enough talking. Let me let me let me keep reading here because I'm just I'm I'm just going on on and on and on and on. Um. So, so they were offering a cash prize. It took 15 years for anyone to succeed. Could you imagine that? 
15 years to figure that to figure out how to can food. But finally, a man named oh man, I was hoping his last name was gonna be Canning or something. That's the way, you know, Thomas Crapper. <laughs> um, Nicholas Appert claimed 12,000 francs from Napoleon's administration. That's right, Napoleon. Napoleon's army. Napoleon went all over the place. Napoleon went down the Mediterranean. He conquered the city of Jaffa in Israel, um, you know, all over the place. He couldn't have done all that without having good food or food brought to his soldiers. Now, did they have cans when he went and did that? That I don't know. But it was Napoleon's art. It was Napoleon's administration that had issued this uh, challenge. So in 1809 is when Nicholas Appert figured out. I'm sure that's not how you say his last name. He figured out that you could heat seal containers and preserve the meat inside. You could do meat, fruit, fish, and vegetables for an impressively long time. So, oh, interesting. The upcoming Napoleon biopic is not likely to include the origin story of canned food, yet the need for more nutritious military rations resulted in the can of chickpeas sitting in your cabinet. So it started because of the military, right? That's how it started. What's in a name? a wealth of home canned fruits and vegetables, as you can see here, you know, these days, like I, I feel, you know, and that's the thing too, the technology became domesticated and soon people could can things. If you knew how to do it, you could do it yourself. And that's what people would do. That's how people would get through winters, man. You know, it's like, you, you could can stuff up or, you know, I mean, you could also keep, keep things cool in a fruit cellar. Um, there's something I've been pondering for years. Why is it called home canning when people make pickles or preserves in their kitchens with glass jars instead of cans? The canning word and the reference to the can itself is kind of secondary. Interesting. So the idea of canning has nothing to do with the fact that it's kept in a can, but rather is a, a you know, it's a, it's a method. It's a methodology for preserving the food. Um, explains Anna Zied. Zied is an associate professor of history at Virginia Tech and the author of Canned, The Rise and Fall of Consumer Confidence in the American Food Industry. In fact, she says that the process of hermetically sealed food and heating the containers to kill any bacteria was originally called appertizing after Appert himself. Okay, so just as I was saying you know, I, I bet you the guy's last name is Canning. It wasn't, but of course, like with anything, with any great inventor, the, the last name ends up becoming the verb of the thing that they invented. In this case, appertizing. Uh, I love that. While Appert is known as the father of canned food, Zeed notes that there's a lot of research suggesting that the method was not something that he had started, that probably women in their homes had been doing something like that for a long time before him. Interesting. So it's actually something that originates, you know, in uh, domestically in the home uh, via women. Uh, not only that, but Appert didn't use cans himself. Instead, Zeed sa uh, instead says Zeed, he likely started out with ceramic containers sealed tightly with cork. In 1817, William Underwood, a canner from England, immigrated to the United States. The William Underwood Company of Boston became prominent, supplying canned food to expeditions and Civil War combatants. Some sources considered Underwood to be the source of the word can, as well as claiming uh, that the company's bookkeepers began abbreviating the term tin canisters in nineteen in 1839. So that's where, wow, so that's where it comes from. That's really, really interesting. You know, um, <clears throat> it can be sticky. And you know what's sticky? You know what else is sticky? Riot Stickers, the official sponsor of the From His Channel. That's right. Riot Stickers. That's what you need. If you have things that need sticking, you just go to Riot Stickers. You can get a thousand stickers for $79. Link is down in the description. You can't beat that deal. These stickers are printed on vinyl. Okay. It makes them waterproof. 
and they have a UV coating that protects from the sun, keeps those colors looking crisp and nice, okay? Um, you, you really can't go wrong with Bryant stickers. They'll give you three inch by three inch vinyl stickers, square vinyl stickers, a thousand for $79. You go to ridestickers.com backslash from us, get a thousand stickers for $79. You really, really can't find a better deal than that. Uh, it's great value. Let's play the little video and then we will get back to the fascinating world of canned food. Riot stickers, we are the bomb. That is a fact, Jack. Do not get it twisted. All right. And now back to the exciting world of canned food. I mean, come on. It, it really is amazing how, how everything we do, everything that we have done, that we have accomplished is because we were able to take our nutrition with us to places that nutrition dare not go. <laughs> Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary points to an 1853 book called A Pictorial View of California, including a description of the Panama and Nicaragua routes with information and advice interesting to all particular as containing the first public use of the word to describe a tinned canister of meat. So the so the the idea of the concept of using a the concept of a tin canister of meat can be traced back as far as 1853, at least, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in text, can do. For soldiers, sailors, and settlers, canned food was a valuable resource, one that could handily prevent dangerous nutritional deficiencies. In the mid-19th century, before the Civil War, canned foods were largely the, pro the, pro uh, the province of people who were in extreme situations, as I just mentioned. Uh, whether it was Arctic explorers or people who were going to be sailing across the Atlantic for months. Now, that was immediately what I thought of when I, when I first saw this article, I immediately thought of Arctic explorers and as well as what happened very famously to the terror. Now, they, they, uh, in 2008, they did an incredible, incredible miniseries about the terror uh, it's sort of like a fictionalized retelling of a very true story. Um, <clears throat> and part of one of the subplots in the terror is that um, the canned food, the tinned food, they had a bid from three different companies and they took the cheapest bid from one of the companies that makes the tinned food, the canned food. And um, the, the cans went bad. And not only were they, there, there was spoilage, uh, on various cans, but also uh, that there was lead that lead that poisoned the uh, the those on the expedition, and that's what they're talking about here in history today. Uh, this is from Sheila uh, Roth Robotham uh, from 1987, October 10. Questions are raised about the death of men in John Franklin's 1845 Arctic expedition. Uh, they famously went missing, right? They went missing. A lot of people died. Dramatic evidence that lead poisoning was a key element in the failure of Sir John Franklin's 1845 Arctic expedition has come from the result of postmortems conducted on the preserved bodies of three of Franklin's crewmen taken from the frozen graves on Beachy Island in the Canadian Arctic. They were trying to find a middle passage over through the Arctic that would allow them uh, 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 faster shipping routes 
to the other side of the world. And what happened was the ships got stuck in ice and, you know, they're icebreaker ships to begin with, but they could not, they could not break free. And that led to a whole series of problems. Um, protein of the sea. Anyone, anyone know about that drink from the old days? I don't know what protein of the sea is Fox. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> The last trace of Franklin's expedition to search for the Northwest Passage to Asia with two lavishly equipped ships and 129 crewmen came in April 1848 when the surviving crew, Franklin and 23 other members had already died, abandoned both the Erebus and the Terror for a march across the ice. And I, I can't I can't recommend the series enough. Go watch AMC's The Terror. It's so fucking good man it's so 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 good um gots to look it up later way and weird i will love it all right i'll check it out um he's referring to the drink protein of the sea sounds really gross um <clears throat> the point being that they that the authors of this book speculate that the regular consumption of this tin food particularly as a luxury item by the officers played a fatal role in the mental and physical decline of the expedition nine of the 21 deaths prior to april 1848 were officers including that of franklin insidious ingestion of lead weakened its members to a point where tuberculosis and phenom uh, pneumonia uh, wrought havoc, conditions identified by the postmortems on the Beachy Island bodies. Anorexia, weakness, and paranoia would have compounded the effects of starvation scur and scurvy, leading to the final horrors of cannibalism. And in yeah, it gets it gets gnarly. Um, Beatty's test on the skeletal remains found on King Williams Island indicate that the body had been deliberately dismembered bone marrow removed and what were identified as knife marks were visible on scattered bones from arms and the legs. Uh, this confirms the early tales of the, I'm gonna, it's a Inuit Eskimo is a pejorative term. The Inuit natives, I believe, I believe I'm attempting to use the proper term. I hope that's, that's correct. The natives, whatever the natives to the Hudson Bay search party of 1854. Um, <clears throat> From the mutilated scene. So it eventually led to cannibalism because the can so what does that mean? It means you gotta can your, your food right. Because if you don't, you're gonna wind up eating your friends. That's what's gonna happen, uh, as what happened on the terror. So it's interesting how how bad seals on cans could wreak havoc. You know, if you're taking your food with you and you're traveling to these extreme places and your food becomes compromised you are going to be in deep crap uh canning also made foods available out of season and far from their origins making them appealing to a different kind of clientele wealthy colonists or Im immigrants were able to get tastes of their home country or something like it by shipping over these canned foods when they were really expensive she says i mean you got to think about that there was a time where if you wanted something, you had to wait for it to come into season. It's ama It's truly amazing how like spoiled we are when it, <laughs> using the word spoiled, ironically, uh, how spoiled we are when it comes to foods. I mean, now you can order a food that you really want on the internet and have it sent right to your door. But imagine like, oh, I want that food. I have to wait a whole year for it to be in season to acquire it, you know? Um, but as canned foods became more available to more people, skepticism about them grew. Industrially canned foods in these opaque containers that come from unknown places, the only thing you know about them is what's on the label. That's true. There's got to be a lot of trust and buyer confidence uh, via the label, right? Like, because how, I mean, there's no other way for you to tell, you know, you, you don't know. I mean, any kind of meat, you could put horse meat. And that was one of the jokes in the, in the show, the terror that they were actually eating horse meat. There was a stark difference from the way that consumers had really forever engaged with food, which was by picking it themselves, feeling its weight and its heft and its smell and its feel to know if it was good, if it was ripe, if it was still fit to eat, if it hadn't spoiled. 
All these things disappeared behind this opaque metal wall of the tin can. That's so true, man. And that's like really the beginning of the separation of people with their relationship with their food. Back in the day when you were responsible, if you wanted to eat a fish, you had to catch the fish, you had to gut the fish, you had to eat the fish. If you wanted to eat venison, you had to shoot the deer, you had to gut the deer, and you had to eat it. It's like, you know, if you want a hamburger... Although I don't really think they were eating hamburgers back then. If you wanted a side of beef, you know how you had to get go and get it. You know, so it's like it's like with the industrialization and manufacture of our foods, we lose touch with the foods themselves and our ability to discern what it is that we're even consuming. You know, and this is what led to in the early, early, early 20th century, you had, especially in urban areas, you had crazy, crazy, crazy um, uh, 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 lacking of standards for how meat is handled. You know, that's what led to the, you know, the FDA and the health department, you know, and like all those regulations, you know, people hate, people always say, oh, I don't want government interfering. Government regulation has saved so many lives when you think about it. Like, sure, like there's a lot of things you don't want the government to be regulating, whatever. I'm not going to here to argue with you about that. But the idea that, that, you know, think about all the people that have, you know, like, you know, been saved or spared because the government took care or at least uh, put standards and practices in, into, you know, uh, into, into practice that, that are, are into play that allowed you know, this for the safe, safe consumption of meat, you know, I mean, it's the lack of government regulation that partially led to the spread of the black plague, right? Like nobody that, you know, it was just, <laughs> just different times, man. Kyle says the PBS poison squad documentary is amazing. Covers the disgusting food safety issues in the American processed foods in the early 20th century. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, really interesting reading material. Some of it is really gross. I mean, like people were eating rotten meat. Like people in those places, you know, um, you know, in 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 factories where food was being processed, where meat was being processed, people were just eating like the worst things alive, like just really bad shit. And now we have different standards. Although it's it's things have gotten worse because. Now we're we're dealing with industrial farming. Everybody's become so comfortable with not having these relationships with food, right? And now you have you have situations where it's like it's like you know out of sight, out of mind. Myself included, I'm a part of this system. I don't want to be a part of this system, but I am, and I don't do enough to just stop it. You know, the idea of like be I feel super against industrial farming, and yet I participate in it every time i buy a hamburger every time i get a steak from the supermarket unless you're you know going to you know whatever local plate whatever um so yeah i don't know it's all it's all very interesting but yeah it's like it's like it's true man with the it's interesting how that really starts though with the tin can i mean people take canned foods for like granted and stuff but like it really is it, i would man i would even put it on like if you had like a top 10 list of like moments that like changed, you know, humanity, I would say that, man, canned food might be on that list, right? Yeah. I mean, people really do. We always, we always say, oh, the FDA and the whatever, everybody's trying to poison us and poison this and poison that. But like, and that's true. That, that is true. I mean, look at what happened with the, the tobacco industry, but at the same time, think about all the things that, the good things that they've done too. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not one way or another, you know, um, a golden age, but by the 1950s, the United States entered what Zed calls a golden age of processed food, a time where people really loved canned food and frozen food. That's when the advent of frozen TV dinners, man, right? You have frozen TV dinners. Thank you. I'm glad you think it's an interesting topic. I think this is a fascinating topic, right? For homemakers, sorry, sorry, getting ahead of myself, companies primed consumers by putting out cookbooks and programming 
aimed at extolling their benefits. So it's like all of a sudden you're reading a magazine and that's when the cream of mushroom soup, hey, you can make a really great casserole with this. You know what I mean? Like it, that, it's it's incredible. Or you're watching TV with your family. It's the 50s. Howdy Judy is on and then something comes on for cream corn. Oh, I have, I have a hankering. Let's go down and get some cream corn. Uh, for homemakers, used to, uh, homemakers used to make everything from scratch uh, with what was locally available. Uh, it was now a revelation. It just felt like such an abundance, such ac access to so many convenient foods that reduced the labor of cooking, that reduced the time of cooking, Zed says. I mean, it's really crazy when you think about it, man. Um, it's really freaking crazy. Like, Think about that. Like, think about like when you when you know there's some great things on TikTok. I don't know if you've ever seen. Um, they're just people that like they pretend to live in the 1800s or whatever. Uh, what's that one guy? There's that one guy. He's really really great, and um, they just show all the old school methods of cooking, and like they show like a wife making like dinner in the eight sometime in the 1800s and all the fucking steps. It's like so much time went into just cooking the meal. You know what I mean? Like think about how we have freed ourselves. The, the, the things that we did to live, we've, we've managed to compress that, that time so that we can be free to do other things. Although we, some would argue maybe, you, you know, wasting time by just being on your phone, you know, uh, you're, 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 heat, you're nuking something in the microwave and you're scrolling up, you're scrolling Instagram while you're doing it, you know, but back then it's like, oh, we're going to make like a, f <laughs> it's like, you got, if you want bread, you got to bake the bread first. You got to break the bread before you can even make the grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, you want butter? You got to churn that fucker. You got to churn the butter before you can even put it on the bread to make your grilled cheese. I don't know if they make grilled cheese. That's what it is. Kyle. Thank you. Townsend's Townsend's channel. That's what I was referring to. Yes, and John mentioned uh, Steve, MRE Steve, MRI Steve from 1989. Yes, I've, I've subscribed to that guy as well. He's really interesting because he covers the history of MRE meals, and I am fascinated. This dude eats, we were talking about hardtack earlier. He had Civil War hardtack, and he eats it. It's 160-something years old, and he's eating that. He eats all sorts of stuff, man, um, from, all, from, from all over the place. It's so interesting to see how the food is packaged and preserved and everything's like single serving, single serving cigarettes, uh, M and M's, all that, uh, charms, candies. Um, <clears throat> and he'll eat stuff. That's like a hundred years old. He'll eat stuff that's six years old. He'll eat stuff from world war two. If it's somewhat edible, or if he thinks, if he feels confident enough, he, uh, uh, Steve will eat it. He'll eat the Vietnam, uh, spaghetti and Frankfurters called the five fingers of death. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a really, it is a really, really great YouTube channel. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. And the Townsend's Townsend's as well. Uh, that's that guy. He, he's like, he's sitting there and he just like, you know, he, he's the dude who, 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 who schooled me on the salted pork, you know, taking this really dense piece of meat and having to first soak it, rehydrate it. And then you can begin to cook and prepare it. And I'm sure all that salt, you know, some of it, you know, the, de you're desalting the pork, but some of the salt stays on. So you have a little flavor, this, that, and the other. Um, let's move on, shall we? Uh, and by the way, if anybody here is really enjoying this material, we've also done the history of Halloween. We did the history of Christmas. We've talked about the history of um, uh, the, the mid-Atlantic accent. We've talked about bone bread. We've talked about mummies. Um, we've talked about corpse eating in the eighteen in the eighteen hundreds. European corpse eating. We've talked about monks that self mummify themselves. Lots of really interesting stuff here on the channel. If you like this sort of thing, um, he had some brand new ones recently. New technology. I'll check that out. I love Steve M R E nineteen eighty nine. That's his name. That's his name. There's a whole community on YouTube of people that trade MREs. They're, they're like collector's items, man. Um, I, I could literally spend hours watching them just open that stuff up. He opens it up and he goes, oh, there's a hiss. Oh, there's no hiss. It's all about the hiss. Uh, 
talking about the homemakers. Uh, while canned foods have lost quite a bit of their glamour since, yeah, now today, like, here's the thing. On one hand, they could be really, really fancy. And that's like, well, again, that article, I think I mentioned this before. I, if, you, if you go back to the beginning, I was muted briefly. Um, you know, <clears throat> I was reading an article about how the appeal of, of, of tinned fish, fancy tinned fish in like Spain, you know, and how it's really good for you. You got um, omega threes and protein and you could, you could open up a pack. You could dress up ramen really nicely with a, with a tin of fish. It keeps, it keeps really well. You could you find it in the international section in your local supermarket. They got, you know, squid, octopus, um, calamari, uh, oysters, mussels, clams, like all sorts of really, really good stuff. You can get smoked trout, salmon, of course. Uh, you have tuna fish, which is the most common one. Um, anchovies are a little bit too salty for me. I don't really care too much for the saltines, but yeah, man, there, uh, there's something about it. It's really, really healthy. It's really, really good for you. Um, it's relatively cheap and it keeps really easy, but there's also like, like, <clears throat> there's also a stigma around canned food now. Like now, like there's something like canned food, like to eat canned vegetables is no good. You know what I mean? Like you do have fancy canned food, but you also have like, Canned food is kind of considered to be trashy. Um, while in the 50s, what they were talking about before about people loving canned food and doing cookbooks with canned food. I mean, people, people, there were a lot of really interesting food faces. We did a whole thing about savory jello, like jello aspects, a a spices, a aspects. Uh, really interesting, really, really interesting as well. Um, so like I said, while canned foods have lost quite a bit of their glamour, uh, since Zed points out that they're still an, um, an immense part of our culinary lives. The way that I talk about it is that canned foods became invisible rather than became out of favor. That is a per wow. Uh, so much better succinctly said than I ever could have. It's not that they, it's not that people, it's not that they were like stigmatized. They're, they're invisible. That's a much better way to say it. Like we just take them for granted. We just think that food originates out of, out of, you know, cans, right? Um, people certainly do continue to eat them. That's true, man. Uh, when it comes to the public perceptions of canned foods, it's been kind of a rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall, she says. Attempts have been made to recapture a bit of that mid-century magic, Zed notes, pointing to a Campbell's Soup campaign from 2012 that targeted hipster tastes. They put, a, they put out Spotify playlists that set the mood for the food you were eating, she says. They put out these cat memes, these soups from that product line, notably came in plastic bags instead of cans. A long shelf life. So here's a colorful array of tinned fish. Remember when I was talking about that tinned fish? I, you know, that's what I, when I was reading the article and I was looking at tins just like this. I was going, man, you know, that, that yeah, I don't know if glamorous or fancy or whatever you want to call it, but I'm like, that's fucking good eating right there. It's like you have your allotted portion, you know, you know, if you've eaten that, you're getting really good oils in your body. It's just, it's good for you, man. And it makes you live longer. It's part of that Mediterranean diet. That lasts forever, you know? I'd argue that canned food is currently gaining some glamour back. There's this trend for conservas. That's the Spanish tinned fish. Especially the form of canned seafood from Portugal and Spain. That cool wine bars serve to customers still inside the tin. That's what's fun about it, too. You can just open up the tin and you get a fork or whatever and you just eat it out of the tin. It's fun. It's like a fun act. I don't know. I like I like doing it. Uh, even the humble canned bean is getting a glow up with the Hooray Bean brand SW rolling out a line of heirloom varieties. Um, Piquito, Pinquito, and Jacob's Cattle in contrast to their classic beans. Um, at Trader Joe's, they have the Cannonelli beans, and we do a lot with those. Those are really, really, really great. We make a, I make a pasta dish. I turn that into like a – I make a tomato sauce, and we add pasta. It's really wonderful. Add some cheese. That is a really delicious, cheap vegetarian meal if you're not looking to eat um, meat, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not a vegetarian or anything, but you know, there are times I go through these phases where I try to avoid as much meat as possible. Why? Cause I just think it's good to not eat meat all the time, you know, for whatever reason, it, it's just, it's sometimes it's good to just eat beans or, or fish. And some people don't consider it to be meat, even though it is. Uh, but in the end, no matter if I'm buying something exotic, like steamed brown bread, you know, that brown bread, I don't think that's exotic. That's uh, <clears throat> that's a staple. Uh, a lot of people like do reaction, like reaction channels. They do it for Sue's whole cooked chicken in a can, which is absolutely vile. And it has this like weird jelly inside. Totally gross. Uh, or basic garbanzo beans. I find canned food comforting. Sure, most canned foods have a use-by date, but tales abound of people eating canned products that are decades or even a century old. And that's we were just talking about Steve. That totally freaking does it. Um, Kyle says that Portuguese canned salmon bread spread is good stuff. I bet, man, that that sounds delicious, man. Uh, John says the Japanese brands are good too. Perfect little size. I mean, that's the beauty of it. Like, it's just like it's like contained it's in the can you can eat the whole can without feeling guilty it's great man you, you really cannot go wrong with canned fish it's just fucking awesome um i really do i really do like it a lot i do feel like canned food has this association with either canned food drives and food pantries or apocalypse preppers that's the, that's a whole other topic says Zed. but the reason there's such a staple of both of those spaces really is because a hundred years from now, you can still eat a can of food. So it's pretty cool that a fairly old technology can still really bring such value. And it's funny, like, sure, we have like freeze dried foods now. Like there's a lot, like food technology is definitely increased. People, you know, preservatives are used, which aren't good, but preservatives are used to like process things, this, that, and the other. Um, but for the most part, it's this, this is a technology. This is a, you know, centuries old technology that really is still very viable and still very necessary. You know, um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, and that's really it. That's, that's, that's it for, for tonight's show. A nice quick one, huh? I, I love doing this stuff, man. I really do. I love talking about these interesting, if you ever have an interesting topic you want, you want to uh, explore here on the channel, you let me know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, man, I love canned food. In fact, I think I think I'm gonna um I'm gonna go to Wegmans. I'm gonna check see what they have in the aisle next time. So how about that? Um <clears throat> thank you. Uh join me again uh tomorrow night, I think, for another show. Uh, what will it be? I don't know. We're going to find out. We will find out. Time will tell. Uh, until then, peace, hair grease, and we'll see you next time.